Uh, and I would like to give our, our fantastic panelists the opportunity to, to address you on what I think is a, a really important issue. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by, by three excellent speakers. Uh, I'll introduce them in turn uh, and just tell you the story of the panel that we'd like to leave you with. Uh, but we are looking at the military and intelligence aspects of security in the context of, of Latin America. So first up will be Dr. John Griffiths, who's the research director at Athena Lab. He's going to be talking about the role of the armed forces in intelligence within the region, which often, as we've heard already, is in support of civil authorities. He's going to be talking a little bit about some of the challenges that that brings, particularly for some of the national bureaucracies, in how you subordinate and integrate military under civilian control, particularly where the militaries have been so instrumental in actually creating the nations in the first instance. Uh, John will then hand on to Captain Stephen Anderson from the Royal Navy, who is a liaison officer. So he's part of the UK Ministry of Defense, but he's a liaison officer with the US South Command. Because he's a liaison officer, he's speaking as a member of UK Ministry of Defense, not on behalf of US South Command. And he will be talking about uh, and building on, I think, the presentation we heard from Jeremy Brown, who quite eloquently and perhaps controversially explained where Latin America might sit within British priorities. But, but Stephen will be talking about this from a, the military to military perspective. What opportunities are there to mutual benefit uh, of Britain engaging at a military to military level within the region, including uh, touching into Antarctica, which we haven't yet picked up on particularly so far. And then Stephen will hand over to uh, Dr. Fabiana Pereira, who is an associate professor at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies at the US National Defense University. I should explain she will be speaking in her capacity as an academic, not as a representative of the US government, so please her comments to be taken in that context. But she will be looking at the US views of the region. And I think picking up on the points that we've raised throughout about great power competition that came out brilliantly from two questions in the last panel, but also in very much in the context of the first panel we had today. So I hope the story of this panel is one that rounds itself off, but also helps round off the conversation we've had, which has been a really stimulating conversation to date. Each of the speakers will speak for about 10 minutes, and then there'll be an opportunity for, for you to come up with uh, questions and answers in that. So panel, thank you very much for joining me. And John, over to you, please. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I will ask to answer two questions the role of Latin American forces facing current strategic insecurity threats, and also the current role of intelligence in order to address those threats. First of all, I would like to start saying that according to the International Stockholm uh, Peace Institute, uh, Latin America is the most Pacific region of the world in conventional terms. Uh, due to the absence of traditional war. However, it is the most violent region on Earth, with 85 of war in Africa, 30% of global assassination. I mean, it is not so specific. Latin America is in the middle, currently, of three different crises. The first one, a continuation of a political one from decades. The second one, a serious economic crisis. The third one, a dangerous security problem. The same crisis at the same time, acting at the same time. By and large, then, Latin America, in my humble opinion, it is in, the, in general, in a low level of the state-making process. I'm going to explain why. Because it, is, uh, it has a weak political institution, high level of violence and corruption, lack of the rule of law, transparency, and low level of governability, among many other different features. Which is why it is important to mention the weaknesses of the state-making process in Latin America, because this is highly related with the task that politicians assign to their own forces. Um, it is relevant, as I said before, because the role of the military could be defined according to the following hypothesis. The weaker the state-making process, the broader the professional role of the Latin American forces. Conversely, the stronger the state-making process in some countries, the more professional role among the military. 
it is not the securitization, it's, it is not because the military wanted it. It is the politician ordered that wall of securitization because of the weaknesses of the institution of the state. In other words, the armed forces are being used as a solution for problems of internal security due to the weaknesses of the state institution, particularly those in charge of the public order. To sum up, it is mainly the state-making process, the key factor that is defining the role and mission to the Latin American armed forces in general. On the other hand, as we consider that Latin America is in the middle of security crisis triggered by the action of narco-traffic, the impact on transnational criminal organization, and the huge wave of internal migration, illegal migration, they are at present involved in internal duties more closely uh, related to law, to mission of law and orders. That is the case in Mexico, Brazil, Peru, and through exceptional constitutional law in Chile in recent time too. The militarization, as I said before, of security, it is the result of the weak state-making process. I can I could do both. Thank you. <laughs> in relation to migration and refugees, due to the Venezuelan crisis, there are seven millions of refugees from Venezuela, mainly in Colombia, Peru, Brazil, and Chile. Of those countries, the hottest spot regarding illegal migration are in Colombia and Chile, in the north of Chile. The migration per se is not a threat uh, or a problem, uh, it's that of narcotraffic groups, transnational organized crime, that are using, using the weaknesses of border control to export their criminal activities throughout the region. Consequently, what are the Latin American theater of strategic security more relevant? First of all, to deal with transnational criminal organization. To have an idea, the FARC were 8,000 men, the Maras in Central America, 80,000 men. And the most recent created criminal organization was the Narco Sur, 35,000 men in arms. I mean, this is a huge amount of people dedicated to criminal activities. The second one, to fight narco traffic specifically. And the third one, to secure the country's borders. That is going to mean a closer work between the Latin American armed forces with the institution of public orders. According to the particular realities, of every state or constitutional law in every country. That is going to need a, 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 to improve the interagency pro process, or what is called a whole government approach between the uh, institutions that are oriented toward to fight criminal organization, but the other institution of the state that could support that activity. Additionally, to continue working in support the state institution in the impact of natural disaster as a result of global warming. The real challenge for Latin American countries trying to deal at the same time with a strategic to enforce a mature state-making process while at the same time facing the aggressive security challenge transnational in nature. It is about to fight organized crime versus the disorganized state. To face transnational threat we require multilateral answer from the regional state, too. Those answers will be more efficient only if we do have more robust state in terms of that process, the state-making process, from local government to high level of the state. Though at the end of the day, it is an effort that involves the entire society to have a robust state and also, more important, a robust democracy. What role does intelligence play in fostering security in America from, from, from the armed force perspective? Intelligence, as you know better than me, as a state capacity is crucial not only to face the security challenge, but also to allow a strategic thinking process for each state to have a clear picture of risk, threat, but also opportunities in, in an international order defined as great power competition, or as uh, Dr. Neil Melvin defined a week uh, ago in Santiago, a great power confrontation, which it seems to me it, it's a better idea of what is happening at the international order. In Latin America, regarding intelligence has many weaknesses, such as there is no intelligence architecture in the majority of the country. More important, the national security architecture does not exist. Third, 
intelligence is a highly ideological notion associated to repression during the Cold War. Um, there is a lot of bias in that. The current state of affairs in the level of threat due to the transnational nature of main security challenge demand more than ever multilateral coordination and intelligence that are at the minimum level or sometimes does not exist. And to finish, internationally and among the different states, we can observe in the country with some level of intelligent organization the stronger culture of the need to know over the health culture of sharing of information to face transnational threat. In other words, there exists a lack of integration and coordination within the intelligence community. And the level of institution that exists uh, belong to the military, but the military are not in charge of national intelligence. They are in charge of strategic intelligence. Uh, additionally, there is a lack of expert, specifically civilians, in this field. In other words, we don't have a critical mass of specialists uh, highly prepared to face a current security challenge. By and large, the lack of an intelligence architecture and robust security institution is another evidence of the fragile stake making process of the state in Latin America. Um, I would finish with that. Thank you. John, thank you very much. That was really fascinating. I was struck by your point about the role of the armed forces and therefore the capabilities it requires being something to compensate for the state of development of yep. the nation around it. And that, of course, makes it interesting when you think about military to military cooperation because in the UK, the United States and others, we configure armed forces for one kind of thing. Yep. And yet the opportunities that Latin America might be looking for for military to military cooperation may drive a demand for different types of capability. So, so with that, Stephen, if I could hand it to you and just think, where do you see from the UK perspective and also your privileged position as a liaison officer with US Healthcom, opportunities perhaps for that uh, military to, to military cooperation in the region? Yeah, and thank you, Paul. Um, from, and I, I'm glad this is on the record, and I really thank Rusi for the opportunity because traditionally as a Royal Navy officer, uh, we don't work Friday afternoons. So literally, I'm now on the record that I'm in present at work. But the key caveat to that is the fact that it's, we're five hours behind in Miami, so it's actually Friday morning. So I'll take Friday afternoon <laughs> off when it comes to it. But no, thank you for the opportunity. And I think moving on from, uh, from John's points in particular, and following on from the three sessions this morning where some of the key issues were highlighted from the insecurity and stability um, that is, uh, is prevalent throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, um, the, my aim in particular will be trying to cover some of it from a, from a military perspective. What does it mean to us? Where can we contribute? And where, hopefully, uh, we can assist in, in some of the solutions wherever possible within our, within our powers. Um, on, and it was mentioned earlier at a session, I think, in particular, the, the benefit of think tanks to the military in particular. You know, academia and the think tanks for us are critical because we are very blinkered in our approaches in many senses from a military perspective. So the challenge purpose is absolutely critical. And, and the commander of US Southern Command General, Laura Richardson, uh, she was absolutely intent on contributing to the conference and coming over. Unfortunately, her program uh, and prioritizations changed that. So, so ultimately, you end up with me. But hopefully, I can talk on some of the issues that are, are evident every day within US Southern Command uh, in Miami and then cover uh, some of the questions that have been, been proved on that, on that sense in particular. I've been in U.S. Southern Command for two and a half years in total of a three-year assignment. So I've seen uh, coming through COVID with the instability and security uh, that was prevalent with some of the economic issues that were a consequence of it, vaccine diplomacy uh, and a variety of other things. So, so one of the key points uh, is, you know, living in Miami is tough uh, for a Scotsman because the sun is not good for us as well. So, so you're, you're, it is tough. But the, the fact is I go into a U.S. secure facility and with no windows and all mobile communication taken away from me so I could be anywhere in the world but what my wife does she reminds me pretty much every day that we don't live in the USA we live in Latin America and Miami uh, and the multicultural aspect of that is key but what it does in effect from a military perspective it gives us a true perception of the issues that are, that are clear and evident and the migration issues and, and the instability and every other factor for it so hopefully I can do that it will be it is on record it will be my personal perspective I will talk to uh, Minister of Defence open lines and communications and open source information and where I can 
uh, I'll provide a, a wider perspective as possible and give you an indication of, of the UK-US strong relationship and that with our, our wider allies. So hopefully uh, that will be covered. Uh, my colleague who, who was he had an emergency, unfortunately, Hugh Radford, uh, he is my counterpart within Ministry of Defence and I speak directly to him every day so I can talk on uh, questions on some of the Ministry of Defence strategic policies and other aspects uh, as necessary. Uh, the first point I'd like to... Uh, highlight and promote is the fact that the military like to be in command. We have a structure, we have a command structure that's in place, we have a rank structure, we have a decision making process and we have levels of bureaucracy that like to see us push forward and take command. In Latin America, pretty much all of the tasks uh, that are there, we are in a supporting role. You know, we are not leading in any aspect of, uh, of addressing the issues that are there. So we need to remind ourselves that we're supporting interagency uh, and whole of government efforts in many areas. And it's looking at where we can and can't contribute, and that is one of our, our key areas. And I think if I look at the last few years of, of policy was mentioned in strategic doctrine uh, earlier, is uh, we write exceptionally good policy and doctrine, but very rarely do we refresh it, uh, come back to it, we put it on the shelf and we forget about it. What has happened with Ukraine in particular is a positive in our sense from a Ministry of Defence is, is the integrated review of 2021, 2021 when it came out, uh, is, be, is being refreshed, and it's being refreshed on the basis of what has changed with Ukraine, uh, and is it still fit for purpose? And, and the reality is it, it is fit for purpose right now, but it will take us in a direction of where we need to be to ensure that we continue to apply the levers of military power where we can and contribute where necessary. Uh, and again, I will not prioritize countries, but the reality for me, uh, sitting in, in Miami, working with US Southern Command, uh, if I come back to London, as I've done with Ministry of Defense for the last couple of days, London is very much looking north and east uh, because those threats are prevalent and they're on the doorstep, uh, the same as if I was sitting in another country. So what we need to do collectively is, is raise the profile of Latin America and the Caribbean and ensure that it gets a fair say. Uh, and that is happening in many respects when we look at competitive advantage and, and how we contribute in a global way uh, in particular. So highlighting those threats, the fact that they're interconnected in every sense when we look at our uh, adversaries, both state and non-state, is critical to ensure that Latin America, the voice is heard, and then the right decisions can be made with the right information that's available to, to everyone across those areas. And the second part of that is great power competition is, is mentioned consistently in pretty much every approach that we do, whether it's military, academia, or other organizations. The reality from a military perspective, and I see this in Southcom, if you look at... Um, you know, the US combatant commands, there's seven geographical commands, four thematic. The reality is it's not great power competition, it's great internal competition. Because the internal competition for resource, capacity, and then ultimately prioritization is a bigger battle than many of the battles that are being fought outside with those other areas. And that's the hard fact. So from a change perspective and moving forward and understanding the threats that exist and we have to address, what is happening in a much healthier way is those issues such as uh, People's Republic of China, as Russia, Iran, and, and violent extremist organizations, transnational crime, they are being addressed globally uh, in a much healthier way. So ultimately, every, every part of that needs to be connected. So the onus is on us in the UK perspective to ensure that we're connected with that, and then we take into account our allied perspective, uh, ensure that where there are um, strategic doctrine uh, changes and, and misagreement or misalignment that we look for those areas of overlap and therefore focus on where we can contribute in a manner. Because ultimately, from a, a UK perspective, if I look at Latin America and the Caribbean, 10 of the 14 overseas territories are in the Western Hemisphere, so therefore the protection of sovereignty, the protection of, of the interests of the overseas territories is an absolute priority, working closely with the FCDO who lead in many of those areas. Uh, but ultimately, we need to then continue to contribute and support other areas where uh, our key allies, the US in our case, and then working with the French, the Dutch, uh, who have interests in the region, and other NATO partners is, is critical in that sense. And I think moving on from that is the reality for us that, you know, with 31 countries in, in Southcom's area of responsibility, south of Mexico and south of, including uh, Cuba, south, uh, taking a little cut out for Puerto Rico, um, right down to Antarctica, so, so there, is, there is aspects of that that, uh, you know, 20 of those 31 are, are classed as democratic nations. Each of those 20 are different. Yes, they're dealing with the same issues and the same insecurity and stability problem set uh, that is, is, is common across all areas, 
but they're different in every aspect of the, their military life, their security situations, and their ability to economically support or request assistance in other areas. So we need to look at them differently. Yes, the common themes are there, but we need to take them as individual countries and individual nations with individual needs uh, as necessary. And that's one thing that we collectively are trying to do from a military perspective. Uh, within U.S. Southern Command, we have a framework for Western Hemisphere Ally Collaboration that is coming to fruition, and it's much like uh, many other uh, multinational agreements from a military perspective, and we will work closely with our allies to look at those common themes and then address nations and make deliberate choices and informed choices based on uh, prioritizations and where one allied nation may be extremely successful in one area, we then look to avoid duplication of effort uh, and ensure that we are cohesive and coherent in the majority of our activities as, as we go forward. Um, the intelligence need question is, is critical. And again, from a pure military perspective, uh, the need for intelligence is, is critical. But that intelligence needs to be sound, uh, it needs to be helpful, and it needs to be uh, shared where, where appropriate. And one of the difficulties that we see from, you know, we could take it from top secret information all the way down to unclassified open source information. Uh, we have agreements uh, with our, our, our allies in particular in the US. We have the Five Eyes Agreement, which is extremely helpful. We have other bilateral or multilateral agreements for intelligence sharing. One of the issues we have in Latin America and the Caribbean in particular is sharing appropriate uh, actionable intelligence uh, with each of those partners because there are difficulties associated with that naturally. Uh, some of that is classification, some of that is reliability, some of that is, is security of that intelligence in particular. And I think one of the key areas uh, where I've seen in U.S. Southern Command in particular is the relationship with academia to look at open source solutions to provide the information that those individual countries need, whether that's on maritime domain awareness, whether it's focusing or highlighting illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing. Uh, so it's looking at using academia wherever possible to, to provide those products to the customer. But we need to understand the customer's needs in every aspect of it. And, and that's something that we continue to work on uh, and try and, uh, you know, wherever possible. And the other side of that, from an intelligence perspective, is count, uh, countering disinformation and misinformation, uh, and ultimately doing it in a credible manner rather than just trying to be the, the opposite and, and polar opposite in many cases. So, so that's one of the key focus areas for, our, for us in particular. But, you know, I wouldn't sit here and say it's perfect because it's far from it, and, and it is difficult in many areas. But the the, the need, the demand, and the priority from the allies is, is high, so therefore the, the movement forward uh, to try and uh, in, improve that is, is absolutely critical because intelligence drives decision making uh, and every other aspect of, of what we need to do. Uh, the, the, the other point I'd like to look at is educating and informing. Uh, when I first came to US Southern Command, Admiral Craig Fowler uh, was in command at that time ahead of uh, General Laura, Laura Richardson. And one of the things that came up loud and clear was uh, Southern blindness. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the US would be very honest with us, the majority of the focus has been around the Central American, Colombia, North elements in particular. Yes, absolutely, with Brazil and, and, and Argentina. But the reality is everything south of that, if you were to look at uh, what we would call a common operating picture and look at all of the, the NATO, the allied forces and elements, everything south of those areas is limited in many senses. So we need to improve that southern blindness because it comes back to your point about uh, Antarctica uh, and uh, open access to Antarctica and ensuring that uh, we, we continue to move forward in the right direction for the right reasons in many of those areas. And, and ultimately, and again, uh, being open is, um, it was talked about this morning with respect to Chinese investments in uh, New Queen uh, Province with the space exploration and, and the open investment in Ushaya ports. You know, what we, from a military perspective, naturally are concerned about is the second and third order effect from that. Yes, uh, right now, obviously, uh, that is commercial and there's agreements in place, but what happens next is, is something we will continue to monitor. Uh, but those decisions are naturally decisions for each of those countries in particular. But from a military perspective, uh, that's where we need to continue to look at uh, what is important and why we need to share that information and raise awareness uh, from those, those aspects of it. And, and in many senses, the Chinese investments in Latin American Car Caribbean, what's coming out of, uh, of the US in particular is buyer's remorse. The realization that um, what was agreed at the time may not be what's been put into practice and therefore was it the right decision to do. We understand the decisions that were made at the time 
uh, but was it the right decision? And therefore, we will look to support some of those elements where we can within the military uh, capabilities that we have. Again, caveat, please, that we're, we're not in command. We're mainly supporting in many of those, those areas. And then the final point, I think, is it's what we see in Latin America in comparison to many of the other global operations in particular. It's not a fair fight. You know, the, the fight that we're having in Latin America in particular is not on an even playing field. We will continue to follow the rules-based international system. We will continue to maintain democratic, uh, democratic values and standards. But our adversaries and those state threats will not. Uh, and therefore, we need to look at where we... We, where we can actually advance and continue to, to compete where appropriate. And coming back to an earlier point about uh, the theory of victory, there is no theory of victory. It's not winning in that space. It's competing and competing effectively. So hopefully that contributes to the discussion. I'd be willing to take questions once the, the, the panel is complete. Thank you. Stephen, thank you very much. A couple of really interesting things that we may want to come back to in, in Q&A, one of which is how is the need for military military support and indeed the offer of military to military support changing perhaps in the context of things like climate, uh, just the capacity elements, and indeed the growth of new technologies. And the other one perhaps then is thinking about this in the context of what can we learn from Latin American militaries? Because those countries, militaries that have focused on defeating states have not in the last 20 years or so been particularly successful at building weak states, and yet Within Latin America, John, your, your opening point was that very often the military is used as a way of buttressing states. So instead of thinking about military to military cooperation purely in terms of from the global north to the global south, perhaps, or from west to east, or however you want to describe it, but actually thinking about it as a reciprocal relationship that, that I thought uh, Fiona picked up quite nicely, where she said it's about partnerships, not necessarily just about, uh, about the offer there. But Fabiana, uh, Stephen's given you a great intro in the context of great power competition. We've talked a little bit on the technology elements. Can I hand over to you now to give your particular perspective on this? Of course. Thank you. Uh, to be fair, Stephen also did say people would be off if not for this panel. So he did set it up nicely for the remarks, but also raised the bar in terms of keeping attention from people. So I am grateful to uh, Ruthie for the invitation to be here, and especially to Dr. Solano to speak on this topic. So I was asked to speak about the contested role of the United States as a technological superpower vis-a-vis -vis the region. And I wanna make four points uh, on this topic. The first one is that, as my colleague John mentioned at the start of his remarks, Latin America is a region of peace. We haven't seen a major interstate conflict uh, since the Chaco War or the War of the Pacific. And even those, you'd be hard pressed to find um, like a university curriculum that includes those, the study of those, even in the wonderful British education system is just part of the study of, of military and war history. So Latin America is a region of peace and this is something that the United States very often comes to front and center in its discourses and in its speeches to Latin America. And it's a two-sided thing. On the one side, it's full of praise. It is wonderful to have a region where the neighbors get along where the neighbors are not, the borders might be porous, but are not contested. On the other hand, if you are a region of peace and you're often celebrated as a region of peace, why should the Department of Defense invest in you? The Department of Defense started as the Department of War. There is a very good argument to make that if you are a region of peace and we have every reason to think you're gonna continue being a region of peace and we have vast but finite resources, those are better spent in a region that is not a region of peace. So, again, just to say on my first point, the US comes often from the Department of Defense, from State Department, even within the inter-American system, to this point about Latin America is wonderful, there's no interstate uh, war, and while that is true, it does mean it gets fewer resources, which is a challenge uh, right away. That was my first point. My second point is that this lower level of resources is mirrored internally in the region. Because uh, interstate conflict is at most a distant memory, uh, defense institutions, militaries within the region have low budgets relative to their counterparts in other parts of the world. More relevant to, to the point about technological superpower, even within, when we consider within that relatively smaller budget and we look at procurement, in, even in capable countries, now new major non-NATO allies like Colombia, we're looking at procurement being under 
of the defense budget. And that includes buying socks for the troops, buying food, buying their shirts. That doesn't really leave a lot of leftover money in the budget of Latin American countries for very expensive American technology. The need for the technology is still there. The money is not there. This creates an opportunity for my third point, a competitor to come into a region that is perhaps not getting as much attention from the United States or the United Kingdom as it deserves and offer a more attractive, slightly less expensive, as I learned in this visit, maybe Tesco brand product, <laughs> except not Tesco, uh, but from another country uh, that is challenging the United States. So when we look at the competitors coming into Latin America, this creates some issues for defense. One of the earlier panels referenced that when we think about great power competition, one way to think about it is like it's mom and dad, it's not necessarily zero sum. And I wanna offer that, while that is true overall, when we think about trade or education, issues like that, it is not necessarily true in defense. There are some issues in defense that are zero sum. If you purchased 5G technology from an American competitor, that means that some of your other military equipment is now not gonna be interoperable or some other military technologies are not gonna be available to you because you're using systems and you're using a platform that is incompatible with American products or with British or Italian or Spanish who are the other, or French, sorry, who are the other major uh, purveyors of military technology to the region. My last point, my fourth point that I wanted to make is that an additional challenge, not just for the United States, but for anybody coming into the region seeking to partner is something that some of the other panels addressed very well, I thought, institutional weakness within Latin American countries. To be able to make inform, only the Latin American countries themselves can make a decision about what is the best technology for Chile. That decision needs to be made by Chileans. What is the best technology for Brazil? It needs to be made by Brazilians. My contention is that for the people making the decision to reach a good decision, there needs to be a level of institutional strength and a level of preparedness within the bureaucratic apparatus and the political apparatus that is not quite there yet. In my regular job at the Perry Center, one of the things we do is try to address this by working directly with um, our civilian and military counterparts in Latin America to try to increase state capacity. And the goal there is that states and institutions within the state are in a position to make the best decision uh, for themselves. So to kind of summarize the four points, first to say that a region of peace is wonderful, but it does bring within it a, a level of inattentiveness that can be countered by this great power narrative that does get South Korea to pay attention. It gets anybody to pay attention when you say, oh, but Russia and China are coming there investing. Oh, no, we want to come too. That makes sense. So. In a way, great power has been helpful, great power competition has been helpful to Latin America, I would say. Um, the second was the low levels of investment, and that's a much broader issue that goes beyond security to Latin America's perennial question of what comes first, security or development? Do we need to invest in defense so that our economy can grow, or do we need a strong economy so that we can fund defense? There is no answer to that, and I think that conference would take like all year, but if you wanna do it, I'll come. Um, and then the issue of governance. The region is making, is making strides there. I think subnationally we've seen a lot of promise in strengthening governance and being able to make better decisions. But like so many other places, there is still uh, a ways to go. And with that, I'll wrap up for the next. Fabiana, thank you. That was a, an excellent way of rounding off this panel. And I think rather nice that the panel ends up posing questions for the audience uh, when we get to Q&A uh, as opposed to uh, the, the other way around. Uh, we will go to questions in a moment. Just in the interest of Rusi's independence, I ought to say other shops are available, not just Tesco's. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, but I think that's given a really fantastic overview of, of the challenges of military and intelligence within the region, the opportunities, and I think some of the threats, including the one, Fabiana, you closed with, but also David had closed with the previous panel, which is if it's seen as a Pacific environment, 
then how do you generate enough interest to do that? And John, I'm struck by your opening point that whilst it's a Pacific region in that context, it's also the most violent place on Earth. So how on Earth do we reconcile those tensions? But with that, I'll throw it open to questions. Uh, there's a gentleman who had his hand up there uh, with the, the, the white shirt, please. Uh, you might need those, because I think if, if the questions are coming to you, uh, the fantastic team here, Hi, um, I'll come to, to you, sir. Yeah. Should I make the question? Please, if you could introduce <laughs> yourself as well, please. Okay, yeah. My name is Gregor De Broy. I'm a PhD candidate at the Brazilian Army Command and General Staff College. I'm a civilian, by the way. Um, the question is uh, that it seems that there is a consensus among um, specialists on South America that the global north, meaning United States and Europe, should look more at the region because of its potential, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to the practice, um, it's not um, to South America that the global north look. The global north looks to Middle East, Asia, et cetera. So my question goes for the four of you, actually. How hard it is for you to convince your colleagues at the defense and foreign affairs community about the relevance of Latin America. OK, thank you. Um, so we're going to come to you, then to the lady at the front. So we'll, we'll pose a few questions, and then I'll come around for a second round, if that's OK. Uh, sorry, the, the gentleman oh, sorry. just back there. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Ewan Grant, um, former UK Customs Intelligence Analyst covering the ex-Soviet state. Some of my former colleagues, of course, in our investigation service were, um, and indeed perhaps a few of the younger ones still are, uh, liaison officers in what is now NCA. Um, Certainly, originally, we really put some of our very, very best people in South America. We did not regard it as a um, second rate. And I would urge you to look at the obituary in the Daily Telegraph of the much-missed Desmond Logan and his work in Cuba. Um, my question is um, that the captain has mentioned quite a bit of the reasons for the question. Um, defense budgets are stretched, personnel are stretched, equipment is stretched above all because of the situation in Ukraine and perhaps in the Far East South China Sea. What role can the uh, sister navies, armies and air forces of the European countries, particularly perhaps France, Netherlands, which have been mentioned, but also Spain, Portugal, and Italy in building trust and cooperation, uh, both on operational uh, readiness and therefore perhaps easing the supply of intelligence, not least for South America, but across, across the Atlantic in, in Africa. Uh, because, of course, we all know it, it, oh, from our history lessons, it was a tale of two capes, wasn't it? It was Cape Horn, but it was also the Cape of Good Hope. Thank you. Super, thank you. And uh, the lady in the front row, please. Thank you. Just a very quick one, triggered by actually your point of what can we learn from uh, Latin American experience and um, uh, go into the, the crisis that migration place in Latin America, and particularly the 7 million that went, uh, that actually had to flee Venezuela for humanitarian reasons. I mean, those are not criminals, you know, uh, moving uh, around. So uh, the, the point is that m most of them going to Brazil were actually well received and well uh, managed, regardless of all the, the flaws, but by the military. So in Brazil, there is Operación Acolida, which is actually doing a lot of really good uh, migration management. So, the, the, although there are a lot of uh, gaps and lags in, in that operation, still uh, that's a really good example of how this is not necessarily uh, military action to compensate for the flaws of a state or a weak state, actually, it's just a, a role in itself. So, my question is to what extent that kind of, or what do you think of that kind of action, and to what extent that could be part of some uh, this lesson that we can learn from Latin America? Super, thank you. There are lots of questions. I'll pose these first three, and then we'll come back around for another round if that's okay. So, the three questions we've got, and uh, the first one was about. A need, recognizing a need to look more at the region, but how do we overcome the challenges to, to actually achieving that, which is the gentleman there. Secondly, Stephen, it was specifically you were named particularly, but uh, uh, John, I don't know whether you also want to 
pick up on this, what's the role for military and European armed forces within, that, within in the region? And then the third one was about what can we learn and what opportunities are there that you have seen that we might be able to pick up on and transfer back into, into uh, the US or the European forces. So, um, Stephen, as you were named no in the first one, do you want to come in first on yeah, any one or all of those? And then I think, we'll, I, think yeah. I can hopefully contribute to all three in particular. So, Gregor, your point um, about raising awareness, uh, broadening understanding and the profile and importance, um, that, that happens in every sense. So I think from a military perspective, um, our voices are absolutely heard. The key difficulties, as ever, is when it comes into a central command, and I don't mean that as in uh, central command in Tampa, I mean it as in Ministry of Defence here in London or to the Joint Staff in the US and others, they have the difficult task of managing resource and capacity. So we have to prioritise. And the reality in a military sense, uh, we have breakdowns of divisions. You know, We call it J1 to J9, the J being joint. Um, and three is operations, current operations, five is long term. Uh, the reality of the global situation right now, you know, yes, some of it dominated by Ukraine, but it's impacted elsewhere, whereas the, the five in particular should be looking long-term strategies, so therefore they're looking out three to five years and beyond, but we're dealing with the here and now, uh, and that's a reality from a military perspective, whereas we need to open those apertures and ensure that the, the situation is well understood, the risk is understood in particular, but in the, in the case we're in right now, we're far, being far more reactive than proactive, which is wrong. And there is, there is an aim to, to try and turn that and, and move forward. And Ewan's perspective on the, the security cooperation, you're, you're absolutely right, Ewan. The, the NCA liaisons are still there. They're still strong. They're still um, critical uh, and essential. And this comes back to my point about it needs to be an interagency report. This can't just be military solutions to all of these problems because we only have a small part to play in many of them. But the, the, the sister navies, air forces, armies, uh, one thing you see in Latin America and Caribbean in particular is that those relationships are as strong as ever and continue to be strong. So the key exercises that, that occur annually uh, on a variety of size and scale, uh, when we look at uh, Panamax was mentioned earlier for the Panama Canal security, UNITAS, is broader maritime security, and then the trade winds exercise is predominantly Caribbean focused, but it, it goes out in both areas, hurricane assistance, disaster relief, preparation. And what you see there every year is every nation uh, working together closely, including the allies, to ensure that we try to prepare ourselves better, uh, look at uh, mutual compatibility in many areas, and ensure that we're ready for any activity that comes forward. So, so give you some reassurance that we're we're at, continue to focus on that, and that's one area where we can contribute. And then the last the last thing on migration, and again, it comes back down to from a military perspective, our UK policy for the military on migration is different to the US, is different to to Brazil, and different to others. So, so again, the whole of government approach on migration is critical, and where military UK military has a part to play and We've seen it recently with migration coming from Haiti through Turks and Caicos Islands and then into uh, South Florida in particular. And we see it, you know, any other migration through the Darien Gap up into Mexico and the likes. There is an absolute military part to play in that. Majority of that is intelligence driven because it's, we need to deal with the issues at sources wherever we can. But we need to be working with the governments of those areas as possible and understanding who has the responsibility. So I absolutely agree there are parts to play in it, but, but the, the individual nations will determine their own policies and permissions that enable those activities in particular. Hopefully that answers. Thank you. John, you're clutching. Oh, you're, OK, please. Put, that's fine. So Fabiano, I suppose for you, you, you raise very very well within your four points and need to look more at the region and how do you do it. So maybe if you could maybe look at that one and also anything that you've seen in the context of what we could learn from the region perhaps. Um, so on kind of how to raise the importance of Latin America, I would say that if the US is paying attention to something in Latin America, that's already bad. You probably don't want that. That's going to be issues like Iranian tankers coming to Latin America, Venezuelan migrants going to the Darien, uh, illegal unregulated underreported fishing. Um, I think it's helpful instead to think about it as, as, as it is, a series of bilateral relationships where both parties have the responsibility of keeping each other informed. Um, and with this, I want to come back to a point that Dr. Islas made in her panel about we have cooperation agreements, memorandums of this, of that, and the other, but at the end of the day, it's a person-to-person -person or institution-to-institution -institution relationship and the responsibility on both parts, on the United States and its partners, to kind of keep those contacts up to date so that the, part, the partners can prepare and get PhDs 
and be knowledgeable about how to raise those issues to the appropriate person when the time comes. So I will say that it's half and half. Some of it is going to be like US leadership and trying to pay more attention. But a big part is also on the partners from Latin America learning how to speak about how to best represent their interests um, in that forum. On the issue of Europe cooperation, I actually think great power competition creates a big opportunity for Europe to present itself in areas where it overlaps with countries in Latin America sharing values, which is something that um, Mr. Ridley addressed in the morning, without being seen as the United States. It's another phase of democracy, another phase of respect for human rights that might be welcome in a place where the United States is being shunned for any, any reason. So I think that, that if Europe and the United Kingdom are willing to take that opportunity, I think opportunities are opening all, all over Central South America and the Caribbean uh, for more engagement. And on the last question on the missions and migration, I would counter that this is, creates more challenges than, than it helps, at least when you think about bilateral relationships. So the use of the military in Latin America as the kind of state actor of last resort to address things that are not normally military missions creates some problems in bilateral relations because it's hard for the US Army or the US Navy to talk to institutions that are doing a mission that they were not trained to do. They're not, now they're army and army in name, but in practice they're executing army and border patrol missions. And the US is very, very um, adamant about its lanes and keeping the military in its lanes. So I would say that while it is innovative and it might work other places, so I'm not condemning the Latin America's use of the military uh, in other roles and missions. I do think it does create some problems uh, for engagement because now the appropriate actor is no longer the one with the same title. It'll be, you'd have to find out where does that role reside within the other state. So I think it makes the issue a little bit thornier. Thank you, and John. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm going to answer the, the question about the, the role of from Europe that we can learn about it. Uh, I would say that I was checking the, the amount of uh, military investment in, in the region, in Latin America, and the majority came, uh, I mean the majority of the material of the military platform, uh, the Army, Navy, Air Force, or Special, or Cyber, came from the United States and Europe. And when you have uh, that relationship, you are buying not only a platform, you're buying, you're buying a strategic relationship. And, and in that way, you have a lot of influence, I mean, in the region be, be, because of, of the material of that. And we can learn a lot about it and how to uh, enhance, uh, I would say, the, the role of the military to face the challenge of the 21st century. Be, because you are facing the same uh, different uh, uh, threat because we are in, an, in, in a global, uh, international order in which the threat are transnational in nature that require multilateral answer. And from that point of view, we should learn a lot from Europe about how you are dealing with that. You have a high level of cooperation though, but what a problem in, in Latin America, that we want to have a, a high level of cooperation or integration, and we have not fulfilled the basis of that to reach that kind of cooperation. Because first of all, you integrate in Europe because you have a infrastructure integration. Second one, in 1952, you started a integration in energy. And then you got the political integration. But the question is that we want the political integration in the region without having uh, the two, uh, I mean, <laughs> the two prior integration. And this is something that we have to study and to have and to plan in order to have a very cooperation integration among the countries of the region. Uh, besides, uh, well, the role that also we should be playing is how you are integrating the interagency process, the whole of government approach, and of course acting in internationally in combined operation. And that required to integrate the different equipment in a, in a common picture. Um, and this is something that we are going to need when we are going to use the force for non-traditional mission like uh, the effect, let's say, of uh, climate change in order to support the inhabitants. How, how you're 
doing that. I mean, if, if you focus on the Latin American architecture, it is the architecture of the Cold War. Where is the architecture to the post-Cold War? Because we, are, we already knew that we are going to face a, a challenge uh, that required the level of cooperation, but we are doing nothing in to create an architecture to face the challenge. I mean, there is a lot that we can learn from Europe on, on, on that, and you have, a, I would say, a great, uh, the perception of the Latin American uh, in soft power is very good from Europe, because they are using, they are using submarines from France, uh, platform, uh, armor platform from Germany, uh, arms from the UK, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we have, a, we have a, I would say, the condition to, to, to improve and to learn on that. Um, and, I was, and I will also add a, a short commentary about migration, which is, uh, and per se, migration is not a security threat. I mean, it's movement of people. But because we do have open borders, like in Chile, 850 kilometers with, with Bolivia, with more than uh, 100 of crossing path or uh, in the borders uh, that nobody control. And uh, we have only eight uh, paths that are controlled. We're going to need to secure our border and, and, and to know who is immigrating. Because at, 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 at that moment, there is a thousand of people every week and we don't know who they are. We don't have any information about that. That's the problem with a massive wave of immigration, that we don't know who is coming. And when you are living in, in, in a geographical area in which criminal organizations are your main threat, you have to focus on that problem. If not, you are buying a serious problem that's going to affect, at the end of the day, citizens. I think my main problem is that I'm now going to reach into your tea time by about five minutes, I'm afraid, but I, I work on the basis I was late starting, and therefore I, there were lots of questions. I do want to come to them. Uh, so the lady in the second row, then the gentleman in the, the row in front, and uh, then if I could ask you please to be quick with your questions and uh, also quick with the answers, otherwise I will be a bit like a hippopotamus, or getting between a mummy hippopotamus and a baby hippopotamus with, with tea break. Thank you. Um, my name is Kate Smith from Babcock International, def UK defence company, who Captain Stephen, you will know very well. Um, my question is mainly for you. Um, it, you sort of left it open, I think, how sitting in Southcom, uh, the US and allies see the security threat and risk environment in Latin America, South Pacific, Atlantic, Antarctic. If, <laughs> this is a big if, which may be part of your answer, you do see it as a region of great power competition, as we were talking about in the morning. What sort of, what difference is there between your analysis of the military capabilities that are needed by those countries and the analysis they do themselves around more sort of uh, limited, exclusive economic zone patrolling, constabulary duties. So wh where's the gap in analysis and capability needs? Thank you. Super, thank you. Could you pass the microphone to the gentleman in, in front of you? And what I think I'll do is maybe ask you to focus on one of the, the questions to provide an answer, and then we'll do a quick wrap up at the end. Sorry. Thank you. I'm Juan Pablo Toro from Athena Lab. Commander Anderson, uh, for you. Uh, as maybe you know better than I, these days are two Iranian warships visiting Rio de Janeiro. And also in South America, we used to watch with a lot of concern this huge Chinese fishing fleet that switched from the South Pacific to the South Atlantic, but over a regular basis. So my question is, uh, do you see uh, increasing connections between the security dynamics of the Indo-Pacific with the security dynamics of Latin America, and maybe that, do you think it's a good idea to raise the profile of Latin America, connecting these two security, identifying these connections? Thanks. Super, thank you. And uh, I think the, the gentleman over here. Thank you. Juan Bataleme from the Argentine Council of International Relations. For the commander, it's a, a one question which is keep my mind working. How Argentina can start to think 
military modernization without triggering a kind of the security dilemma with the, in the South Atlantic with the UK. If we are honest with us, the last war we fought were fought with Western weapons, French and, and United Kingdom made weapons. And the situation right now is we are thinking about Russia and China as a military provider. So we must solve this. And how is your military pers perspective on that? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, you so, seem to be in the far right. Easy, all three. Uh, can I ask I you... Did, I did say I don't work on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I think it's not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so maybe, Stephen, if... if no um, I can do it quickly. I think, Fabiana, maybe if I can ask you to take the second question about the security dynamics of the Indo-Pacific and Latin America, because it seemed to be a broader question than just uh, Southcom, perhaps. But, uh, Excellent. No problem. Okay. So, um, and please and, be quick. Thanks. You know, from, from a Babcock perspective and with industry in particular, it's so important that the industry understand the capability needs, because without those needs that are crystal clear from the military operators, then we cannot drive forward with future investments and capabilities in other areas. So, so I think from a US, you asked the particular question on our understanding. US-UK uh, situation in particular, uh, we are 100% compatible. So the, the messaging, the intelligence, the analysis that's done on both sides, even though it comes from one, uh, will be looked at subjectively and ultimately the response in, in 99 times out of 100 is we're in absolute agreement. So we're coherent with the requirements, we're coherent with the capabilities in order to address the, the security issues that are prevalent, and we support our partners in the nation wherever possible, and whether that's US foreign military sales, or whether it's uh, UK sales, defense sales in particular, uh, we do whatever we can at all times, but the issues there, are, uh, we are coherent in, in the problems, and then making every attempt where possible within the financial constraints and other constraints to, to move forward with it. On the, I'll do it very quickly on illegal and reported unregulated fishing. It came to the fore um, off Ecuador about to of the Galapagos, of the, you know what was what was happening with the Chinese fishing fleet in particular, uh, and that profile has been raised significantly throughout for the absolute right reasons because of of what is being taken out of both the Pacific side and the Atlantic side. So it's absolutely all connected. When it comes to the solutions, again, we have limited military, limited capacity to address them, and, and I'm being honest about it, the U.S. Coast Guard have the U.S. leads for that, rightfully so, from a, a maritime security perspective, perspective and the military op options are increasing. The one key benefit for IUUF in particular is our engagement again with, with academia, with other organizations, so Global Fishing Watch in particular, uh, raising the profile and with Florida International University, ensuring that that intelligence when it comes to switching off of uh, automatic identification systems and other uh, activity is shared because that's open source information and then uh, ultimately raising the profile on that. And then the, the final point on, uh, and again, I, I'll, I'll try and give you as much as I can on, on the, the modernization in particular. I, I, again, we, we fully understand uh, the requirements for nations throughout. The decisions are above my pay grades. You know, I can't contribute to that, and I, and I wouldn't attempt to because that would be unfair. Uh, but what I can say is that naturally the UK continue to work with our allies to ensure that solutions meet what we in the Western world believe to be the right solution for the right needs uh, for the country in particular. And naturally, none of us... Uh, from a military perspective, uh, we would like to see the GF-17 uh, in Argentina. Uh, and that's, our, that's a military, that's looking at the risk and the threat. Um, but again, it's a decision that's made by the countries. And from a UK perspective, we'll continue to work with the US and others to look at viable solutions. Uh, but again, Stephen. above my pay grade, I can. Okay. Yeah. Stephen, thank you. Uh, Fabiano, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to any of those, uh, those answers. No, I wrote down that because I think that's a good question. I want to back to my seat if you want to talk. And when you get an answer, please come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, John, is there, any, uh, no. Governor, is there anything you want to add to any of those? It seems to me that after mm. the war uh, between Russia and Ukraine, China is going to be the winner in the region, I mean, supplying yeah, yeah. material. And um, I, I would made a, a, I would like to underline what uh, Professor Melvin said. We are living uh, a great power competition and confrontation. We at the region are, are seeing both competition because of resources. What resources? Well, copper, lithium, rare air, whatever. But the confrontation focuses on obtaining geopolitical gains in bases in the region. And this is what we are currently seeing uh, from China. And this is, in my opinion, more dangerous of 
the competition, the, co the level of confrontation or potential confrontation that it is creating, establishing some basis on our region. John, Fabiana, Stephen, thank you very much for your really stimulating presentations and also the, the very candid way in which you've answered questions. And I think also very nicely led into Carlos's final panel, which takes it back out of the military domain and into the, the geopolitics.